Good afternoon. My name is Chad Griffin, and I'm the board president of the American Foundation for Equal Rights. We also have our co-counsel here today, uh, Theodore Olson, who you saw argue on our behalf, as well as David Boyes. Um, we also have Theodore Boutrous, who argued both of these matters uh, in uh, federal district court, as well as Terry Stewart uh, with the city and county of San Francisco, who you heard so eloquently today. Um, also, and I think perhaps more important than any of us, uh, we have the four plaintiffs in this case that completely were referred to uh, repeatedly as plaintiff, 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 and occasionally mispronouncing uh, their last name. So uh, we have Paul and Jeff and Chris and Sandy um, who are here with us and are a reminder of exactly why we're here. Um, and having not asked anyone else permission on our team of what I'm about to do, if Mr. Cooper's still here, I would like to cede my time to him and have him come explain a bit more of what to me was the headline today where he expressly stated um, that allowing gay marriage uh, would not in any way harm uh, heterosexual marriages. Um, at and least not now. At least not now. There was some discussion of that in the future. Or any time that we could figure it out. Um, again, as you know, those of you who follow this case, um, that was not what uh, was stated repeatedly in trial, um, and that was, uh, I think, a headline moment for many of you and for many of us. Um, assuming he's not uh, going to come back and answer your questions, I'll, I'll speak very briefly. Uh, today we take one more step in the march towards marriage equality and one step, one step closer to the decision from this court and to the day when our plaintiffs, Chris and, San sorry, Chris and Sandy, <laughs> and Paul and Jeff can celebrate a marriage with their families, their kids and their parents. Sadly, the issues before the court today were ones of desperation and bias by the anti-marriage proponents of Proposition 8. The proponents of Prop 8 attempted to undermine our country's judicial system by accusing the U.S. District Chief Judge of bias simply because the fact that he is gay, the way he was born. The time for their delays and distractions and baseless claims has come to an end. The American people are now saying with increasing force, in fact a majority, that they support marriage equality. Our Constitution's promise, the promise of liberty, is one that every generation must realize. And the fight to secure marriage equality is the defining element of our generation's search for greater freedom. Um, I just want to end on a note, once again putting the spotlight on the actual personal faces and couples. I've already mentioned our plaintiffs, Chris and Sandy, and Paul and Jeff, who have now been waiting since we filed this case almost three years ago to get married. Um, they represent thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of Americans like them. And some of you may recall, in fact, some of you here wrote profiles of <coughs> Aaron's and Ed, a couple who had been together for almost 40 years um, and were brought to the public attention by the Courage Campaign, by the Los Angeles Times, and by many of you who talked about them. About a year ago, they made their story public that they had been together for 40 years. They met at Polytechnic in San Luis Obispo, and they were living their lives 40 years together in Palm Springs. And they wrote a very eloquent letter and a video saying that they could wait no longer. They wanted to get <coughs> married because Ed had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And they wanted <coughs> to get married while Ed could still remember the occasion. And sadly, Ed passed away last night and they won't realize that dream. Um, and I think today could be a moment where we remember Darrance and Ed and that we don't allow any members of this generation and young people and couples like these plaintiffs who want to get married to deny them that right. It is time to stop treating them as second class citizens and we are well on our way. And with that, I will turn the podium over to our brilliant co-counsel uh, who have led this case and represented uh, these plaintiffs um, for the last three years. Um, Chad, David. And Terry. And Terry. Um, how about, you wanna do this in alphabetical order, David? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna be very brief because, I mean, I think Chad really said it. Um, when we started out in this case, we said we were going to demonstrate that marriage is a fundamental right and that depriving gay and lesbian citizens of that right terribly harmed them and their children and that depriving gays and lesbians of marriage equality didn't help anybody. Um, they conceded that marriage was a fundamental right. They just said gays shouldn't have it. Um, their experts conceded that not allowing gay couples to marry grievously harmed them and their children. 
And today, you heard them concede that allowing marriage equality isn't going to hurt anybody else's marriage. That's what we said from the beginning. And today, you heard Mr. Cooper say, we disclaim that depriving gay and lesbian citizens of the right to marry uh, has any benefit. It doesn't help anybody. I think that's the end of the story. And you saw today how hard the proponents behind Proposition 8 will fight to prevent and delay a resolution of this case. The first hour was about whether or not the American public could see what happened during that trial. And our opponents make the argument that somehow witnesses in a case that might take place in the future would be discouraged or harassed or intimidated, yet all of their witnesses testified on video depositions that are available on websites anywhere. And there was not one single shred of evidence that any witness would be intimidated by seeing what, by the American public seeing what happened in this trial. We are anxious for the American people to see what some of you saw every single day in this trial, the truth, and to see what the judge had before him when he was making his decisions, and to listen and hear to see and the witnesses actually testify under oath, and some of them subject to David Boyce's cross-examination. <coughs> they don't want you, the American public, to see the trial. They claim that they are somehow misled by the district judge. This is the first time a lawyer has ever said, gee, the judge ruled a certain way, and therefore it can never be changed, and I somehow relied on that, and so forth. They're saying that they do not want the American public to see what happened in this trial. Now, is there any good answer to the argument that the American public should not see the trial of a constitutional right of hundreds of thousands of Americans that 13 million citizens of California cared enough about to vote on. And this involves the Constitution of the United States. And they don't want you, the American people, to see it. What does that tell you? The other thing is that they're saying that inferentially, because they do, they, they, after a year or so after the trial, when they knew darn well, um, the judge's sexual orientation, that the case should be thrown out and everybody should start all over again because is, he's gay. Which is, as David pointed out, I think extremely eloquently, as, as did Terry, that would mean a black judge would not be able to rule on the constitutional right of black children to go to school, or women couldn't rule, women judges couldn't rule on cases involving pregnancy or abortion, uh, or uh, plan uh, planning for children, birth control, and things of that nature, or a person with diabetes, or something like that, a, a hidden condition, couldn't rule on a, preg a, on a disability case. Minority people can't rule on issues involving civil rights. That's what this is all about. Uh, and those things are completely peripheral and beside the point with respect to what the fundamental rights are in this case. But they're fighting so hard because they don't like the decision that this judge made, and they don't want you to see how fair and impartial and level-headed he was throughout the whole case in rendering that decision. Because if you did see, if the American people did see the trial, the idea that the judge was biased would be out the window. So that's what we're fighting about today, and we're going to keep fighting, and we're getting very, very close now to a decision by this court and very, very close to an end to this case when we will vindicate the rights of the citizens of California to ma marry the person they love, irrespective of their gender. A week? Oh, oh, oh. Uh -oh what did I do? <laughs> a, week, uh, <laughs> a week or two ago, the California Supreme Court held that the proponents have a right to be in this case and had a right to be in this case to represent the interests of the people of the state of California in defending Proposition 8. 
and yet they come to court and argue that they can conduct the trial on behalf of the people without the people being able to see the video recording of that trial. We have a statute in California, not to mention constitutional cases, that says the people don't delegate to their public servants the right to decide what's good for them to know and what's good for them not to know. And so the proponents of Prop 8 here have no business as claiming the mantle of the state and representing the people of trying to hide the work that they did in the trial, not to mention uh, the, the opposition in the trial and the witnesses and evidence presented on the other side from the people who they claim to represent. Um, I want to also just add on the motion to disqualify, um, we in the gay community have heard for way too long, um, oh, it's not because they're gay, it's because they have a relationship, because they have an intimate relationship, because their relationship is this or is that. That's what that motion was about today. It was saying, it was trying to say this isn't because he's gay, but I noticed they didn't say he, if he was a heterosexual getting married, there would be a problem. It's because he's gay and he's in a relationship and it doesn't distinguish him. Every gay person has the right, like every heterosexual person, not only to marry tomorrow or next week, but even if they think they don't want to marry um, right now, they're convinced of it. They get to change their mind. They have the right, the freedom to change their mind and they have an equal interest in that. And they also have an equal interest in it because as the testimony at trial of our experts showed, the stigma that Prop 8 imposes by treating gay people differently from heterosexuals falls on every gay person, straight, gay, straight I mean in a couple in a, in a, who's single or, or otherwise. It harms everybody, including young people. So I think this whole notion that it's because Judge Walker has some sort of special interest because he's in a gay relationship is a smokescreen. I don't think the court, I mean the court did push back to us on that, but I, I think in the end, um, I'm optimistic that we will win that. But the double standard that the proponents um, advocate in every circumstance, that different rules apply to gay people than other minorities or than anybody else is appalling and I'm tired of it. And I hope that the court will say something about that in its decision um, and, and emphasize that the same rules apply to us as everyone else. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. Um, I, did, I don't know how much you see when you're out there waiting, but Mr. Cooper did not even approach the podium. And I think that says a lot. And, and I, I wanna thank you for coming down here and, and talking to us because it, it, it again, it just highlights very great difference. Uh, uh, two, uh, two more uh, questions. First off, uh, uh, opponents of uh, Proposition 8 are uh, claiming uh, that the reason why uh, they're uh, supporting uh, this measure is uh, because of uh, religious liberty. Uh, uh, would you uh, care to uh, comment uh, on that opinion? And number two, uh, Proponents are also suggesting that they uh, will be pushing uh, for a ballot measure <coughs> in uh, 2012 uh, uh, regarding uh, this uh, same issue. And I was wondering if is that uh, something uh, under consideration? Well, I'll say something about religious liberty. They didn't mention that during the trial. They had a 12-day trial. They could have put on any witnesses they wanted. This case is not about religious liberty. It doesn't inhibit anybody's religious liberty, it is about the First Amendment and it's a, 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 the right to association under the Bill of Rights, it's the right to marriage, which is a fundamental right, and if they're now saying it's about religious liberty, I guess they thought that up two years after the case was brought, and, and uh, it's clearly an afterthought because it wasn't mentioned during the trial. I just don't know where that's coming from. Um, and the, the other question David gets to. No, I just, I'll say a word about that too, and that, and that is that uh, the First Amendment to the Constitution uh, guarantees uh, everyone's religious liberty. Um, and it also guarantees that no one can impose their religious beliefs on anybody else. And what you have here is you have a group of people trying to impose their religious beliefs on somebody else. And that simply isn't consistent with the Constitution. They can exercise those religious beliefs. They can believe what they want to. They have the right to do that. And we respect that. But what they cannot do is impose those beliefs on the rest of us. And I've seen no ballot measure filed by them, so I 
I don't think anybody's going to be I, on I, that. I, I don't know what kind of ballot measure they're going to file anyway. The, the whole thing about the Constitution is the voters of California, no matter how much we may ha hold them in high regard, cannot amend the United States Constitution. A lot of what's happened in courts throughout this year on Prop 8 has been the side <coughs> issues. Tell me about what happens once these two particular side issues are resolved. Where do we go? What's the next step in this case? If you would. Uh, well, the, the next step um, is that the court will address the merits of the case. Um, uh, as uh, uh, both Terry and, and Ted indicated, the California Supreme Court has now answered the question, and um, and so I think once th these last two motions are cleared away, um, that means that the court will turn to deciding the underlying merits of this case. And so I think, as they said, we are stepping closer and closer uh, to the day when uh, people will get a decision on the merits of marriage equality. I know you. The court has no deadline, but do any of you have any estimate on when the court might rule and whether it might rule on all three issues at once, the third being the underlying substantive issue? I don't, I don't think any of us know. <laughs> they don't tell us very much about that sort of thing. I do think that once the California Supreme Court rendered its decision on the standing issue, this court has been moving rapidly. It set a very short deadline to file uh, for us to file briefs on the standing question. That deadline has passed. Those briefs have been filed. It set this, these two issues for argument quickly on the same day at our request. We asked that, um, and the court is moving forward on that. I think the underbrush is being cleared out of the way. We have filed all the briefs on the merits. We had the argument on the merits on the constitutional question on December 6, one year and two days ago, right here. Um, and. I'm optimistic that we're going to get a decision on the merits soon from this court. And we're optimistic also about the outcome. Uh, not only we're hopeful and optimistic that it's going to be soon, but that it's going to be a very favorable decision. One last, question. One last quick question. I'm kind of curious, today's proceedings, you guys are basically having to argue on behalf of Judge Walker. Tell me about that. It's just odd to me, he's not even a plaintiff, but he became the focus of both hearings today. Well, I think, Terry, Terry you might want to say something about that, but I think what, you know, what we have said all along uh, is what you know, Terry said here you know, at this podium, uh, whether it was Judge Walker or any other judge, it was a particular bias um, against having a gay judge. Um, and the irony of these two hearings, one, they're saying the judge was biased, therefore the trial was biased, the other, the actual tapes from trial, which would allow them, if they're right, to prove their case to the American people that the judge and that the trial was in fact biased. One would think it would be quite the opposite. If, if what they believe that they said uh, in round two today is true, you would think they would be the ones arguing for the trial tapes to be made available for the world to see so that they could prove to the American people um, their, the very point that they have worked so hard uh, to attempt to convince judges and the public of. Um, one other thing I will, I will add to that is, as you know, um, once the trial court uh, was not broadcast live, one of the things that the American Foundation for Equal Rights committed to was ensuring that we would do everything we could to let the American public in on and see exactly what happened uh, in that courtroom. Uh, in fact, the desperate attempts by the opposition to hide those tapes has created tremendous de demand from around the country um, <laughs> for those um, wanting to see what actually happened in that courtroom. If it's so important to hide, it must be something we really should all see. Um, and to that end, a lot of things have happened. Um, one, we had the premiere of 8 LA, a play that was written based on the exact trial transcripts from the federal district trial that premiered uh, in New York with award-winning actors and cast uh, playing the actual individuals on both sides uh, from trial on March 3rd. Um, that same play will debut uh, in Los Angeles, directed by uh, Rob Reiner, um, as well as um, Michelle Reiner, a producer, and Adam Umhafer, as well as uh, Lance, who brilliantly put together um, a, a fair portrayal of what happened in that courtroom. And at some point next week, uh, we will be announcing the cast 
uh, that will be playing uh, those who are behind me um, and those who were previously at this podium. Um, so be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>